All right. Welcome. Welcome, committee members. Good to see everybody this evening. Um, we're going to start the meeting, if we could. Um, our first order of business, I think, before I actually move to the agenda is I just want to welcome, we have a new um, committee member, a new at-large committee member was voted in by the uh, by the council last Thursday, I think it was, and uh, she is Sarah LaRose, and Sarah is here with us uh, for the meeting. Sarah, would you like to uh, introduce yourself to the committee? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, everyone. Super excited to be here. Um, so Sarah LaRose, um, lifelong resident of Holyoke, um, senior engineer at Holyoke Gas and Electric, and, um, you know, bring bring a pretty, pretty good background of uh, project project management, um, the ability to kind of manage budgets, schedules and uh, and efforts uh, and get things from point A to point B. And um, as as Mary already knows, also a, uh, a lot of coordination with other with other uh, regulatory groups in uh in the city and and elsewhere as well wonderful welcome sarah we're glad to have you and um yes welcome we, yeah we certainly yeah. uh i think you have a skill set that will certainly uh find great value in for on the committee and we'll uh we'll uh, we'll, we'll 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 try to make good use of that for sure um i do want to yeah. i want i do want to do an attendance as well if i could um now that we know sarah um Mike Falsetti. Here. Mary Moriarty. Here. Uh, Meg McGrath Smith. Here. Maribel Ortiz. Here. Uh, Helene Busby. Here. <clears throat> Sorry. Here. And I'm going to be off camera just for a little bit because I'm having some dinner. Absolutely, Helene. We'll uh, <laughs> keep an eye out. Chris. Here. Uh, Lauren. Here. And Sarah. Here. And then myself also here. We have a full committee. Very exciting. Um, let me get my phone because that's where I have the agenda. Um, our first order of business, as always, um, is just to review and approve the minutes from our prior meeting on October. Did everybody uh, get an opportunity to take a look at those? Uh, Mary did an outstanding job for us, as usual. Any concerns or questions or no. Anything like that no. sounds good. I'd uh, entertain a motion to uh, accept the minutes as written. Make a motion. Oh. Thank you. Uh, all in favor? All right. all right. Do we have to do all a right. call for everything? I don't even. I'm not even sure. Do we? I think we. I think technically we're. I think you probably yeah. do. Yes. So, uh, Mike Fawcetty. here. Mary. Yes. Meg. Yes. Uh, Maribel. Yes. Helene. Yes. Chris. Yes. Lauren. Yes. And Sarah. Yes. And Jay. Yes. Wonderful. So uh, moving on to uh, item number two, the new applicant subcommittee update. And essentially it's just um, an update on eligibility. And there's you know, one thing that we've learned is that there's a lot to it and uh, the, the subcommittee has done great work for us in sort of um, going through every application and making sure that we've uh, adhered to state guidelines, adhered to CPA guidelines. Um, you know, there's a number of things that sort of rein us in and um, there's a lot to it. You know, I think if Mary, if you said you and I exchanged 150 emails in the last couple of weeks, would you be surprised at that? It, it may be something to that degree. Um, just trying to sort out a couple of the housing, um, a couple of the housing applic applications. So I just want to do take a moment just to acknowledge uh, a how much work it is, and b how good of a job I think that uh, everybody's done. Um, and sort of just kind of working together to to get through this. Um, did uh, any members of the subcommittee uh, care to give give an update at all, or give give some give some sort of uh, info? I mean, Chris, I think uh, our next agenda item is specific to your uh, kind of area of expertise, so I okay. think we can wait until that. But okay, um, I think the biggest thing is we need to delve deeper. <laughs> oh, sorry, Meg. For sure. Uh, Meg. 
I was just going to say, we just, maybe we can just run through which ones we have determined are eligible at this point versus which ones we're just, we're still processing through. Sure. I can, I can uh, bring that up and, and give that to us. And um, let me see here. Sure. So as you know, we have three uh, primary categories. Um, so our historic category, um, we've approved uh, four applications. So they are the, uh, and, and this means that they're eligible. This means that their application is eligible to be funded by CPA. Now we begin the process of deciding whether or not we, we want to fund them. All, all we've determined is that they are eligible, that they meet the criteria uh, for CPA funding. So those are uh, the Flats Community Building uh, application, uh, the City Hall Stained Glass Windows, the Wisteria Hearst Retaining Wall, and the Lawrence Elementary School uh, Improvements. Um, three historic applications that had applied, um, the uh, Iglesia Aldeos Church on Appleton Street, St. Paul's Church, uh, also on Appleton Street, and then the Bethlehem Baptist Church. Um, thank you, Meg. Outstanding. Um, those are uh, were, were deemed ineligible um, based on uh, based on advice from the city solicitor. Um, it violates the anti aid amendment. Um, so we were unable to do that. So we've sent out uh, information. There's one sort of outstanding application, the city hall rehabilitation. Um, we're not really sure where, where that is, uh, is going to go. We're still talking with the applicant about it and gathering more information. I don't know, Meg, do you have any updates on that? So we had had um, Tyler Kane of the consultant we had hired look, you know, meet with the consultants uh, who are working on the city hall rehabilitation plan, which is like a massive um, restoration process that will have multiple phases over probably 10 years and it won't start right away. So one of the pieces that sort of came out of that was just that they almost more wanted to share with us what was likely coming almost in the future um, and that they really didn't have uh, kind of a project in mind, like bid worthy, ready to go. And so we had reached out to them and said, well, do you think that you will be able to, you know, one of the uh, small pieces that seemed discreet, that seemed clear that it was eligible was they have some work that needs to get done with the bell tower. And uh, totally, re you know, replacing, restoring the, the roof on the top and then like some structural work, um, both interior and exterior to the bell tower. And so we said, can you do you have enough time to like, can you put this together and put it forward in time for the historic commission meeting? And they said they would uh, go back to the consultants and see if they could do it. And then we didn't hear back after that. And they did not present at the historic commission meeting last night. Yep. So um, I sent out another email just saying, hey you know, is this something that you are planning on? I mean, technically they have passed our deadline. If we wanted as a committee to make an extension and say that they, if they could get it together in time to apply for the December historic commission meeting, is that something that we're open to? Or do we want to say, you know, we already have a number of historic projects have, that have come forward for the city and have been given eligibility. And so at this time, you know, it may be that you're just not ready to kind of get this going at this point and you're welcome to apply once you're ready next cycle. So it's a question for the committee on, do you want us to sort of make an exception and allow them more time? Um, and it may, they may or may not come through with it. Or do you want us to say, you know, it just seems like you're not ready and you missed the, the time frame here. Yeah. And just a bit of information to piggyback on that is that I think, um, and Chris, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we, we would be able to um, timeline wise sneak them in prior to our uh, full application deadline. Um, if they could make the next historical commission December meeting. meeting. Yeah. That doesn't mean that we, that we, that we should, or that we will, but we could, um, could fit them in timeline wise. So, um, you know, I think our options are really to um, move forward and, and, you know, ask them to, you know, come back to us when they have more information, or we could sort of, um, 
sort of push it and, and give them a few more weeks and see if they're able to um, cobble some stuff together. Um, I'm not sure if they'll be able to, but I think, um, you know, I'd entertain a motion either, you know, either way we could uh, make a move. And I don't know, uh, Chris, did you have something? Go ahead. I, I, I think I just want to, to, to say to the board, a deadline is a deadline. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. That, that is know. sort of how I feel, Chris. I agree with you because we were very transparent on the deadline and the process of it. And we did reach out right away, tell them we right. needed more information. Like we, we have been working with them on this for several weeks. Um, and we already have a city hall project here. Right. for the same glass right. windows to finish the last phase of that. So, you know, I think it would actually be really hard to, given that we only have, what, a little bit less than $800,000 in funding to, you know, request or to, you know, recommend funding for this year, it'd be hard to say, like, well, do we want to do the last phase of the stained glass windows or do we want to do the bell tower? It would be sort of putting those two projects pitted against each other. Exactly. So, it does seem more like they wanted, they're getting the phasing going and they wanted us to be aware of projects that could be coming in the future was more their thinking of putting it forward this year. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Is, did anybody have, uh, want to make a motion in regards to that application, perhaps something along the line of, um, of uh i mean do we the, have to it, it missed the deadline like unless somebody wants to make an exception that's true that's true i i, I suppose we could just inform that i i suppose yeah. we're just going to make a decision not to extend so we don't need mm -hmm. to do anything we could perhaps just say you know unfortunately the deadline's passed and and uh you know as they are a, a city project um you know to, to please keep in contact with us and, and keep us updated and we'll certainly work with them uh whenever we can um, Mr. Chairman, does this um, does this have anything to do with the steps that we've talked about in the last six months? I mean, not directly. So that project is is kind of a standalone the the steps project. I mean, in the sense that they are you know rehabilitating a large chunk of the of the city hall. I suppose it, it's it's similar in that sense, Meg. So one of the things that's interesting about what you what you just said, Mike, is that so for. Folks who remember, we gave them money to do a study on how to repair, restore the steps of the city hall, plus the pillars and the, some of the exterior work on the annex. And that report, like, it's still, it's not done. So that's the other piece is they can't, like, in terms of phasing, they can't come to us and say, great, and now we know how much this is, and will you then pay to do this next level of work? Like, they're still waiting for that study to come in. Well, it... it... I just just to remind me, I, I've forgotten. It, it, did we approve of the project for the steps? It's only the study for it, so it's only like the study. So, the, but that, and that that money has yeah. been spent and awarded. Uh, it's been awarded and it's in the process of being studied. So I think the you know I think the study will be done by the end of the year, and the money will be distributed soon after that. Um, be my best guess, but so we can't even move forward on that that next phase until the thing that we previously expended, you know, funding for or awarded funding for is complete. So it's just sort of, I think they wanted us to be more aware of all the phasing of it and like what he, what's coming forward, but it doesn't seem like they're actually ready to move forward right now with any discrete piece. Uh, and Megan, are you referring to the whole building or are you referring to the steps? The steps is included in this plan. So like if you looked into the docs that they sent us, it's everything. Like they didn't actually send us an eligibility application that really named specific pieces. It sort of said like 400,000 for the phase, but they're not actually really ready to jump into that phase yet. Like they're still waiting for the document that the study that we awarded, they're still waiting for that to get back. Um, there's just another of, there's a number of pieces that seem to be still being fleshed out and that are moving yeah, it is, it's, you know, it seems like it's just a little early for them to be applying. And I think the the decision, it seems like the will of the body is to just allow the deadline to expire. Perhaps I'll send a friendly email just to, you know, let them know that we're, you know, we're wanting to work with them and that we're available for uh, support. And we can kind of move forward with that. Is that everybody feel comfortable with that? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, is this... Uh... FY25 eligibility submissions. Where did you guys find that? Where, where is that? Is that on our website? 
It is. Yep. And I can send it to you, Mike. I can send it to you right now if you like. This is the first time I've seen this. I, I... Let me send it to you. Is there anything else? There no, is. Yeah. All, Matt, they're, all, all, yeah. they're all there. All three are, categories are, are there. Mary, are they on our website? Here, Michael, uh, I just emailed it to you. So you can just open the email um, and bring that up. You should be able to. No, that no. Thank you, Jay. Yeah. But I'm wondering. All right. So though, so he, he sent you probably sent you a link. So you're going to open the link and then you're going to bookmark it. Do you know how to bookmark it there? No. Okay. Well, I mean, is, is this on our website? That's all I'm asking. Is, is this information you're not referring yet. to on not our website? Yet. I'll not double yet. check. I'll double check, Mike. I'll double check. You're okay. asking us to make decisions on things we've never seen before. No, we're just commenting on status. No, yeah. I understand that, but I would appreciate it if I could read about it, what you're talking yep. about. Well, no, Michael, I mean, to, I, your, to your point, Michael, I, I agree. Yes, I, I, um, I, I'll make sure that the committee all gets this uh, document. I think, you know, we're, we're discussing it. Well, the, the thought, I think, today was to provide information, but I think you're right. We're discussing projects and we didn't necessarily provide the information to everybody uh, clearly. So um, I apologize for that. And um Certainly, um, I, I'll send that out if anybody else needs it. I did just send it to you via email, and if anyone else would like it, I'll send it out tonight to make sure everybody's got access to that. I think um, that's certainly a good responsibility for the chair to make sure everybody's got that. So I apologize. Um, Meg, would you I mean, go to the housing uh, section for us? And Michael, you're not being expected to vote on any of these because the eligibility committee is the one that's working on the eligibility side of this. No, Meg, uh, I understand that, but I, I'm just kind of shocked. I, I, this is this is news to me. Can can I just say though that like I really appreciate that Jay and this is what happens. We don't have an administrator and I know we're in the process of hiring. Yeah. It's just like I really think it's important. I mean the amount of like free labor that um yeah. me less so honestly because of other stuff but like that this subcommittee is doing is like intense. So um I just I just want to express that appreciation for all that's been done and I you know I I feel like this has gone out in email multiple times before. So I just I just want that to be clear that when we don't have an administrator, it's hard to call our fellow volunteers to the to the to the carpet in that way. So yes, and hopefully we'll have an administrator soon. We um we've made some really good progress on that too. So I got some good updates for everybody. Um so the the housing section um as Mary uh most certainly can confirm is very very complex. So um Mary, would you like to talk about it a little bit or would you would you prefer that sure. I Sure. Sure, I can uh well I I'll go first and then you can fill in what I forgot or yep. I'll try to keep it very concise. Basically, we're, we're, we're still looking at the same thing we explained at the last meeting. It's the business of monitoring compliance. Okay, so when the, um, you know, when we put a housing restriction on, uh, we want to make sure that it's followed through. And uh, always in the past, we've had uh, some other agency that is uh, also funding these projects that we can rely on to do the, you know, the compliance enforcement. We cannot possibly afford that ourselves. But in the case of all of the applicants that we have this year, uh, we don't have uh, another agency. So two of the, the two um, private um, projects, uh, we pretty much had to say already, that we cannot fund them. Uh, that would be the one on Suffolk Street and the one called the Pines uh, at the end of Pine Street. Um, there are three other projects that we're still uh, working through and we've, uh, we think that looks pretty good, but, but there are some additional steps to make sure that, the, um, that compliance is in place. And we're also working with the city attorney's office. So, that's where we are. We can't say for sure if those last three, the three from one Holyoke, are absolute uh, applicants or not, but we could say they're looking better. Yes. Yeah. So it's the, the, the issue is oversight. So in the past, we typically had these more complex uh, affordable housing developments that included um, 
both federal and state monies. Um, and with those federal and state monies came guidelines and oversight that um, sort of covered us in the in the compliance department. So those uh, just by you know coincidence, I think all of our applicants this year um, are all smaller projects, and none of them have state or federal. Um, funding. So they don't have anybody watching them. So if we give them money for an affordable housing project, they could hypothetically put a re housing restriction on file, but there's not going to be anybody to check up on it. So we spoke with the state coalition and they advise us to um, either a ask, um, you know, the local, uh, you know, planning department essentially to review and to, to perform compliance or to consider hiring somebody, an expert on the topic, which we, we um, didn't feel was, was financially viable. So, um, you know, that, that left us with a, with the uh, unfortunate decision of likely having to decline uh, eligibility on those uh, two private uh, projects. The, the, the project with one Holyoke is a little bit different. They, um, you know, they're a bigger organization that has a, like a longer uh, history of, of affordable housing. And they're also working with the city uh, on compliance. Um, so we're going to, you know, we're going to move those uh, applications forward, but it remains very complex. It, it's, it's uh, Mary and I had a meeting, a Zoom meeting yesterday afternoon with um, uh, Michael Moriarty from One Holyoke, um, the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. Is that it, Mary? Yes. And, and then Stuart uh, Saginaw from uh, from the State Coalition, and we just we we went through all of these issues and just discussed what uh, you know what our responsibilities are, what what guides us, what sort of boxes us uh, us in, um, and. You know the 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 long and short of it is that um, we're going to probably be able to move forward with these one Holyoke applications, and the other two are not going to be uh, eligible at this time. But it's um, I can report to the to the committee that you know due diligence was done here. That you know we corresponded, uh, like Mary said, with the solicitor's office. We had a number of uh, email chains going with different state offices, and just making sure that we're covering ourselves. And I think that we did it. We did a good job with that. This was just very complicated, and Mary did a really nice job for us on it, um, as the entire committee did. But I know Mary was uh, particularly focused on that, so I just want to make sure I acknowledge that and give her uh, give her some credit. Uh, Lauren, I was just wondering for the tiny house development. Have you guys checked in with planning at all to see? If that's something that's even viable in Holyoke, before yeah, it, yeah. In fact, um, it, it, we're we're planning on moving the uh, the applications forward as a matter of eligibility. But I actually saw Aaron last night, and I said we we really need to have a meeting about some of the things that we're doing. And he said, I you know I agree. So that's um, a Jeff meeting, not an Aaron meeting. Uh, what did you a what? That's a Jeff meeting, probably Jeff because who? it's zoning. Jeff Burkhart. Jeff Burkhart. Jeff okay. Burkhart. Um, I know that they did tell us that they recently did go to city council and they did get permits oh. for um, for location and size. And, um, you know, I mean, I didn't examine those, uh, you know, those pieces of information. I just went on the fact that one Holyoke assured us that it they had gone through uh, the the city channels and did have their paperwork. Are you so thinking, Lauren, that we need to ask for that paperwork and see it to make sure that it is eligible? Well, I'm, I'm hope. So I'm, I'm on a, hope, it went I'm on a tiny house subcommittee for planning board, and mm -hmm. we as a city don't have a policy about this, and that's something that we're working on in terms of trying to figure out zoning. So I don't know how they would have gotten permits for something that we don't have something in our zoning about. Well, I, I could tell you. Well, it's a good thing you're here. It's a good thing yeah, you're no, here. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I think we'll loop her into the, to the, to the thing, Mary. Um, yeah, I think um, their explanation was that they, uh, their existing locations were, uh, 
were like grandfathered in, I think, was that what it was? Because the, the, uh, tiny houses were spec built and there's some, there's some, uh, explanation they have on the topic. And I'll, uh, Lauren, I will, uh, if you, if you'd like, can loop you in on these emails, uh, with one Hoyoke as we navigate this process. So if you notice they're still yellow, they're still sort of in yeah. the, the maybe category, like we're leaning yes though. But, um, since you seem to have a, a particular, uh, uh, familiarity with this, we'd love to to sort of talk more about it because it is very complex. And like, well, there was yeah, there was one thing that one Julio came in front of planning for that was like two tiny houses on a unit that they were calling a two family, but they weren't substantially like attached. But I think that that went through. But we haven't talked about a development, to my knowledge, unless it was a meeting that I happened to be um, absent for, which. Well, these well, are I'm all standalones as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by a development because uh, that's just sort of not my wheelhouse, but I'm thinking, but, but what he has presented is all separate individual ones uh, yeah. and individual sites. So I'm looking at the third project, which says policy consultant for feasibility yes. of expanded tiny house development in Holyoke. Right. So that it's just, the, oh, right. You're right. It's a study. That's, and a, study. that's, that's a study of, of where that. We go. Right. So it's two actual tiny houses and then one study of the idea of a development of tiny houses. So that's what the three applications are. Okay. And so that is another question that it need that needs clarification, uh, I think, Jay. So, um, you know, at some point, well, I mean, we're, we're, we would be funding a study, period. But uh, the question there is, I, I understood it, that it, it was he was going to study how tiny houses could be developed in Holyoke. But now I'm hearing a different perspective from what Lauren has said in that it sounds like a tiny house development where there would be several in one area. So all mm. of those things are such detail that we had not even, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like I said, it's very complex and there's a lot of layers and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of state uh, agencies that deal with housing. I guess that's a good thing, but it's also can be difficult to sort through and to find contacts and to, and to do that. But they were all to be, to be honest, they were all very, very responsive and very helpful and very available. And I think, um, it, it was definitely a good experience. Um, but yeah, though, that, that's sort of where we are. Um, I can keep everybody looped in as we move through it and particularly Lauren, if you, um, We'd love to have you um, just take a look at everything that we have available and um, and offer any perspective um, as we move through. Um, Meg, would you mind going to the open open and rec um, one? So a lot of red in this one. Um, most mostly was um, park and rec withdrew four of their five applications. Um, I think they just wanted to focus more on one application and focus on, they have some outstanding projects as well, or ongoing projects, I should say. So I think they just wanted to make that their focus and not take on too much. So that's that wasn't a denial of, of eligibility on our behalf. It was just a, uh, I think, a, just a decision in terms of uh, time allotment and focus um, to do that. Um, the uh, Hoyo Compost Hubs, uh, we, we, it, it's not possible. E I'm pretty sure, uh, when Stuart emailed back right away, uh, I think, yeah, yeah. As, uh, yeah. As, well, as, as written is, is not eligible. So oh. it was essentially, it was not, it's red. It was, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. It okay. was not, um, creating new open space and it wasn't, you know, they didn't feel a composting site was recreational enough to, to count as recreational. And um, so we did reach out um, to um, Margo Margo, Weiss. The Margo Weiss um, about that. And, and just to try to offer an opportunity to, you know, amend the application and work with them. I don't believe we've heard back yet, um, Meg. Um, but as it stands, they they also would be ineligible. Um, so, so that leaves us with with the the Hoyoke YMCA and the Glotac Field were both approved, and then uh, the Morgan School Playground um, 
is a little bit difficult because um, funding schools is a is a murky gray area with the CPA, which is a, a topic uh, that we can discuss a little bit more in detail um, later on in the meeting. But that's sort of just the general update on eligibility. Like I said, it's just a lot of work. It's a lot of um, it's an exercise in covering ourselves. It's an exercise in assuring that we're we're putting through um, projects that are eligible that meet all of the all of the law the law and guidelines that um, that guide us. So, um, if uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure if it's we really better for the applicants because if they're not going to be eligible then it's a lot of work to put yeah. in and then exactly. the end not. So it's incredibly kind use of time for, cause we could just be like, okay, just send the whole thing in and then make those decisions. Mm -hmm. So it's very exactly. think, thoughtful of the community. And, yeah. and, and, and I agree completely. Cause these are, you know, the, the applicants that are being uh, deemed ineligible are, are applicants that we we've worked with in the past that we will hopefully continue to work with. And, and we want to, always um you know leave a positive impression so even if they're being you know if they're applying for a for cpa funds and we draw them through the entire process and then decide at the last minute that they're not technically eligible it's we've wasted a quite a bit of their time so i think that's you know one of the motivations for for being um very detailed here but thank you for that um for that mr comment. chairman mr chairman Sir, yes, Mr. Before Paulson. we leave, before we leave this topic or these all yep. these topics, actually, Mr. Yep. Chairman, I've got a, a question for Lauren. Uh, Lauren, um, just to get back for a moment to the tiny house uh, development. Uh, if I understood you correctly, the planning board, or I should say, the mayor and the planning board, do not have a, po a city policy on where to put tiny homes. Why? What are the qualifications? and restrictions that may be on them. Is that correct? So currently, the um, there was just a house bill passed in the state that I'm not familiar with all the details on of tiny houses and where they're allowed. Um, but a development would only be, a, to my understanding, allowed in the zones that are like RM20, RM40, RM60, because those allow subdivisions, and it would just follow a normal subdivision. But anything else, it would be a whole new thing for the city and we'd have to figure out how to do it. This is something that's very much in flux right now as we're trying to figure it out. Okay, but by definition, the planning the board doesn't have anything as we speak. Our zoning ordinance doesn't have anything specifically about tiny houses at the moment, no. Would that, would the origin of such a study come from the mayor or from the planning board? of how to work on the, the well, zoning. Like for example, if the mayor said, called the, plan, the chairman of the planning board said, look, I want you guys to develop a policy for the whole city. This is coming on the horizon, so to speak. Is that how, might that work that way? Or would the planning would, board take it upon normally, itself to, to Zoning do requests study? normally come from, in my experience so far, they've come from city council asking, like putting in an order for us to work on something. And um, then I, we present language to them and then it's up to them how to tweak it and if they want to pass it or not. Um, but I am not an expert in this category. I'm just like sharing no, just... experience. So I might be not accurate on everything. I'm doing my best. But those um, are great questions. Those are all great questions. And I think, um, you know, the way that I look at this is that I look at these projects are of determining eligibility, but these things I think are going to weigh on our decision of whether or not to fund the projects. Like, I think we're going to want to hear from uh, the planning board subcommittee if we could, or hear from uh, somebody from the mayor's office and sort of try to get a context of what their thoughts are um, on tiny houses and how that fits into the, the plan of the city. And I think that will... Um, will influence our decision-making um, of whether or not to uh, allocate to these projects. But in terms of eligibility and just whether or not they meet those basic criteria, we, you know, we, um, that's sort of what we're discussing now. But, um, you know, I think um, I, I'd love to hear uh, if anybody would like to invite um, anyone from the city or different organizations to come uh, discuss the topic, um, let me know and we can invite them at a future meeting. So just one last thing, we were working on a, 
potential ordinance for tiny ho houses. And then with a comprehensive plan taking place, we mm -hmm. thought maybe that would become part of the comprehensive plan. So we did put like a little bit of a pause on things. So just that last bit of info. Yeah, absolutely. Meg. I think the goal is that this would support any work that groups want to do in the city. It would create uh, information that then groups could use to create that ordinance or to create that policy. Um, and I just want to be clear that even if we're saying something has eligibility, um, all we're saying is that the legislation allows us to recommend it if we choose to. We're going to have to have these conversations when they give us the full application um, in December um, when we meet in January and we'll have the public hearings. Every single person who submits a full application will come present in a public meeting um, and we will have the chance to go back and forth with them. Outside partners can come, right? So like uh, uh, members from the subcommittee can come and can ask their questions um, or voice their support or concerns about a project. And then we use all of that information in, sort of in, in terms of choosing how do we want to recommend allocating taxpayer funding. So um, it's, it's quite a process and eligibility just means that the legislation would allow us to fund it if we wanted to. Um, I will say we're doing something a little bit different, I think, with the first two housing uh, things. I think that from my reading of it, it's not that they're not eligible. It's that we know as a committee, we can't take it on. Yeah, that's right. Right. So, and that, that's what we're going to say. So it's oh, yeah. less saying, like, uh, in terms of the notes I put in here, it's less that we're saying we're not eligible. It's that we're telling an applicant, don't waste your time applying. Yeah. we will end up telling you we don't have the capacity to own the oversight that is required by your project. We don't have the capacity. So if you do apply, we will not agree to fund your project. Yeah. That is what we're, that is what we're saying. Yeah. Okay. And, I just think that, and the note different. that we're sending to not them. Eligible. Um, yeah. It's a, kind of a warning off. Sure. You're technically you're eligible, but here's this issue that we have here. Yeah, it's an important distinction, I think, and I, I, I I'm glad that you, uh, that you described it that way. I, that, that's, um, that's exactly accurate. Um, but yeah, if uh, I think that's a lot of those are a lot of great questions, and I think, um, you know, we'll continue to, um, we'll continue to discuss these, these applications as we move forward. But yeah, like I said, they're just very complex, and I think um, one benefit, and I think Mary and I had discussed this, is that. Um, you know, we've gained all this knowledge on process and, and what we can and can't do. And I think uh, moving forward, you know, in future uh, cycles, we'll be able to apply some of this work um, and just sort of plug and plug and play. That's the hope. Anyway, we'll see. It probably won't work out that way, but we'll see. Uh, moving on to uh, uh, agenda item, th uh, item three, just the historical meeting update. Um uh, the historical meeting took place last night. Um, I was able to uh, get to the meeting. Um, it was a lively affair. We definitely, um, I thought, Chris, um, thank you. I appreciate you did a great job, I thought, representing um, the historical commission and, and um, you know, just walking our, our applicants through the process. I think um, just from my perspective as chair, I think in, um, in future cycles, we want to make sure that we're getting the historical commission, the applications, um, uh, earlier, I think uh, yes. I just want to apologize uh, for that, Chris. It was just a little bit um, short, short notice for 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 everybody to review. So I think that's just um, going through the process and learning. I think that's a, a room for improvement next year, and I'm gonna uh, and we'll work on that. So, um, do you, would you like to give us a little uh, brief overview of uh, of last night? Uh, no, just I, I, I think the only thing is, again, just uh, said to us, Jay, it's our deadline, uh, basically, just for us to observe the information, the question and the answer period. I think a lot of it was just very last minute. Um, we uh, it gets a lot of information to divulge, etc. And making that final decision. Yeah, absolutely. So the historical commission just reviewed, you know, our historical applicants mm -hmm. and they asked three, you know, you might say three primary questions of like, why is this historical? Number one, why is this uh, more important than other historical 
uh, applications or why, 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 why is there a, a need here? And then number three was really just ensuring that everybody understood uh, the parameters around uh, preservation restrictions and things like that, and just making sure we're communicating. And um, so all, you know, everybody was able to present. We had four applicants and they were all approved by the historical commission. Those were the four that were uh, noted in the uh, beginning of um, agenda item two, uh, the historical applicant. So, um, you know, we're moving forward with those, with those and, um, you know, we'll see, we'll see how that plays out. Does anybody have any questions particular to the historical commission meeting? Mary? No, but we need to jot down a couple of these notes, uh, for the next administrator. You know, the next administrator, when they come in, they'll want to know, you know, what Chris was just saying about it needs to come in a little earlier, a little smoother. Yeah. I don't know if the administrator can solve it, but that would be something. Absolutely. Chris? We have actually made some changes uh, with the commission itself. Um, a property that has already presented to us, again, presenting again. So I also think it's the alliance with the commission and the CPA to make sure all this information is relayed to both parties. Yeah, and, and also, you know, our two committees, our commissions are doing the same thing. We have the same goals in large part. So it's, um, you know, it's natural for us to work together. And I think um, Chris and I, I think we've had really good communication and I think we'll continue to do so and um, learn from our mistakes. And uh, next year will be our year. Hopefully we'll get <laughs> We'll get after it, but I appreciate it. I thought it went well last night, and thank you for uh, for having us. It was um, a lively meeting, wasn't it? It was. It was. Um, Jay, so, I... yep, Meg. So, one of my questions is, in terms of, because again, we're we're getting clearer every time on process in terms of what applicants need, and I think one of my thoughts is that people need models. Yes. So, yes. What if? home through the presentations historic commission has gotten in the past we find the best presentation that we think best exemplifies what we're hoping for and maybe we give that to them along with that list of questions that jay brought up because i think some applicants too i was thinking after it's on process it's always the issue is that it's not clear is the committee sending it or is it the commission and i think because of that things can fall through the cracks um but maybe like we have to have like a quick joint meeting or something. I don't know, right? Like, um, but I think sending them a model, sending them a list of here are the questions your presentation should answer um, early so that they get it and making clear, here are your resources. Go to Eileen, go to Penny, go to Bob Como. Like here are the three people who are doing a lot of research work in the city. They'll help you. If you don't know what the historic nature of your building is, like who could you go to to get it? Because I think some people just didn't necessarily know who their resources were. So I, I, I think that's something that we can do for next time. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, yeah. I, yeah I, I, we need to have a meeting about the actual procedure. Yeah. yeah. You know, just to relapse everything on expectations from both sides. And the applicant definitely early next yeah. we're getting we're getting closer though i mean i feel like it's yeah i, I agree i feel like we're I, I agree i feel like we're getting there for sure but um no we appreciate that and um what did i do with my phone all right uh agenda my item four is just a discussion on the ballot question um uh, I'm sure everybody uh, is aware of the uh, result of question six so i just wanted to I just wanted to note for the committee, I, I really don't think, and I'll argue this point with anybody, that it reflects even slightly on the on the work that the committee has done. I think that the committee has been, um, you know, an efficient, thoughtful, detail-oriented, inclusive, uh, transparent body. I think they've done, the projects have been popular. I think they've been needed. Um you know, I think it was really just a reflection of folks, um, you know, it's, you know, it's tough taxes that have gone up, you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's just more of a reflection of that than it is anything that I think the committee has done. So I just wanted to, to make that statement and just, um, you know, just say that I think as a committee, we've done great work. And I think that we've, we, you know, as I 
as we go through this cycle, we, um, we continue to do great work. And I think we're going to put forward some really awesome projects for FY25. And um, I just wanted to note that that's my opinion on it. And I, and I just, I, I, uh, I hope nobody felt that that was a reflection of, um, of what they've done. Meg. I just wanted to name that it's so there's a couple of things with the budget, like looking forward in terms of what that means for us. Um, part of it is it's an interesting mix of it having impact and not. So we've never met our admin. One of the things that we've had our eye on is the admin budget because we're limited to we can only use five percent of our total that we raise for admin. And does that allow us to pay for a staffer? Right. That's always been one of our concerns. Um, but a couple of things have happened. So like, yes, like they reduced the taxpayers voted to reduce the reduction by 0.5, which is a third. But also property values have gone up 25 percent in the last three years. So it's a bit of like in terms of the admin budget, like I'm not worried about us being able to have our staffer and we're going into this process where we're hiring this person. I don't think that the surcharge reduction will affect us being able to, being able to hire a staffer at the rate that we want to hire them at for the hours we need. Um, the other thing that I just want to name for the record is there are folks I've, I've heard say like, well, nothing's going to change. Like, because, you know, the values of homes went up 25%, we reduced it by a third. It's like basically a washout. Um, it's not entirely true though, because the cost of projects has gone up by 25%. <laughs> so like the reality is like, yes, we will be able to do less. Right. Um, but also it's in response, I think, to a lot of homeowners feeling that squeeze of because property values went up, right. It is, you know, affecting how much we're, we're raising. Um, and the hard part is like, yes, it's going to kind of feel in many ways, like the number is staying very close to what we've raised in the past. And we're going to have to just be really efficient and smart about which projects we take on because a lot of project costs, as we've seen with, you know, applicants coming back to us, their costs have gone up for construction. A playground that was $210,000 um, is now three hundred. dollars You know, like the Miracle League was three fifty, dollars but the New Morgan School Playground was is five hundred dollars for something similar, right? Like the, the numbers have really changed um, because the inflation is really impacting everybody, right? In terms of housing values, but also everything. So I think it's just, we're gonna have to be really efficient and thoughtful about where are we gonna put the, the funding recommendations that we're as impactful as possible. Most definitely, Mary. Um, so first, thank you, Jason and Meg. Both of those were really good, encouraging um, comments and uh, pointed us in the right direction forward. One of the things that I hope we will all do the next time it is on the ballot is make sure the question is clear. There were many, many people confused when they came out. In fact, some people, I worked the polls, some people would come out from finishing, filling out their thing and their form and try to ask questions. And of course, you know, nobody can answer any questions at that point, but they clearly were confused about question six. So the next time it comes up, we all have to be mindful to help out in making sure it's clear. Just to tag on that, question six of all the ballot questions had the most non-answers. People didn't understand it. Right. So a lot of people left it blank. They were like, I don't know what to do with that question. I had people who called me being like, Meg did the right thing. I said, yes, for CPA. And I was like, no. <laughs> no. And they were like, well, I support it. And I was like, no, supporting it was no. And they were like, oh, I didn't understand that. <laughs> so Meg, there were Meg, to your knowledge, who composes those questions? my lord i've i've followed that process through council very closely i was the only no vote and the council denied my change of language i proposed language that was simple that had a chart that said if your value your house is valued this you'll save 25 dollars. this you'll save 11 dollars. this you'll save this much and people moved the language as it existed forward and you can figure out why so and the, I can the, the city for council is responsible for that, Megan. Is that what you're saying? The city council are the ones that compose those questions. They will tell you that they followed the language approved by the city solicitor. But yes, they voted for it. 
And I do remember that whole thing, Megan. I remember it clearly. We watched it. So that's, that's exactly what happened. Hard to get. We need clear ballot language. And there's a reason why you don't want clear ballot language. Yep. Yes, there's a reason for asking for unclear ballot language. So. You got it. Next time, there's more work to be done. And I actually reached out to Stuart Saginar around it. And there's actually nothing that prevents it from coming up on any ballot at this point. Like it's yep. only the five year period only exists the first time. So like the goal was like when you in adopt CPA, you have to wait five years to decrease it or get rid of it. Like give it time, right? To like start, <laughs> get a chance to do a few projects before you put it up to potentially reduce it or get rid of it. But when I talk to the CPA coalition, there's nothing in the legislation that says that someone could bring it up in the next um, ballot cycle. Yep. So, and I don't know if people want to, but it's an option. Yep. It's interesting well, too. So there's only one other community in this in the state that has ever reduced their surcharge. Um, and it was one community that raised it to the full 3% for a full cycle. And they told their taxpayers, we have to restore our city hall. This is how much it will cost. We need it to be a 3% surcharge for two years so that we can pay for the city hall restoration. And then we're going to put it on the ballot to reduce it. And we ask you all to agree to the increasing and to agree to the reduction in two years. And that's the only community that's ever had a reduction other than us. And it was on the basis that they raised it from their original rate to 3% for two years and then lowered it back down to the original rate after two years. Yep. I mean, based on what's happened in the past with, um, you know, I know it's really hard because these things aren't, aren't the same. They don't attract the same money, but it just would be interesting to see if there's any way to estimate how much we're going to lose as a city um, because we won't, I mean, CPA has been the seed funding for so many projects that have like brought millions and millions of dollars into the city. And I just, it's just staggering to me, like that there's a group of people that don't want investment in the city. I mean, it's just really sad, but I, I mean, it's not just this pot of money we're talking about. We're losing potentially tons of money that could have come in for development projects. And it's hard to, re you know, I think that's going to be really hard to like very clearly quantify, but I feel like it would be interesting because I think that's the one thing. I mean, I don't know if folks, Yoni did the um, tour of um, yep. the anniversary Hill Scott tower, like what they've done thus far. And I mean, just the amount of money that came in, that was jobs, that was increasing access to the site and is still going on. Um, which is like huge. It was amazing. It was like just a complete no brainer. <laughs> yeah. No, so, it was a great example of taking a small amount of CPA money and, and turning it into a, a it. So project. And Yoni uh, explained it so well at that walk. I wish I had been recording them. I was like, Oh, I couldn't have said it any better myself. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it is what it is. And I think, um, you know, we're still in strong shape and I just think, um, you know, we've, we've got a great committee and I hope everybody, uh, is ready to move forward and be productive. I think we're, we're going to do a, do a nice job. Does anybody else have any other questions or concerns on that topic? All right. Um, so agenda item number five is something that sort of, um, came of our digging, um, and eligibility, I think, you know, we, we talked, like I said, we, you know, we had discussions with the city solicitor, we, we hire a historic preservationist and, um, and we talk quite a bit with the state CPA coalition. So, um, you know, we, the, the topic of schools came up and they offered us some feedback on it. And, um, you know, we felt that that was, uh, relevant to, you know, to, to the full committee, it wasn't, wasn't really as more, as much of a subcommittee bit of information as it was a full committee bit of information. So we wanted to just share that with everybody and have a discussion about it. Um, I did include the, um, the exact question and in, in reply that we got from, uh, the, the, the coalition, uh, in the agenda packet, which is what I call the uh, attachments, uh, when I send the agenda. Um, but I, I just, uh, did everybody have an opportunity to review that? And I think, yes. um, perfect. Yeah. So, 
you know, and essentially it just, you know, it, it just offers some, some perspective on funding schools. Um, it discusses, um, you know, politically speaking, why people weren't, you know, perhaps expecting to be paying for school stuff when they voted for CPA. It talks about um, how there's some lack of control in school projects specifically. Um, just a number of different issues that can come up. A number of CPAs, um, uh, just as a matter of process, stay away from funding schools. And we just wanted to have a discussion about that. And um, I've asked Meg to uh, sort of lead that discussion because she was digging into this issue um, in, in the most detail. So Meg, would you care to uh, expand on that? Sure. Okay, so I talked to Sean Chidi yesterday, who's the applicant for both of the school ones, and sort of keyed him in to why we haven't given him an eligibility answer around the Morgan School Playground yet. Um, the Lawrence School one seemed sort of like a, we could move forward with this because clearly the building has historical significance for the city, whether it was a school or not, right? We would want to keep that building restored. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, historical information about it. And there's, you know, photographic evidence, all of that. This playground seems different. Uh, we've never seen any applications come to us from the school department before. So there's two main things that the I wanna hear from the committee and I'm gonna draft a policy based on for us to approve. So, you know, we've sort of moved Lawrence School forward as eligible based on its historic significance. Um, do we want to continue you know, addressing maybe historic properties that, you know, or the historic nature of schools. Um, are we comfortable with that? <laughs> and also, what do we feel about schoolyards and school playgrounds? Um, and this guidance, if you haven't read it, they said a couple things. One, it says the planting issue is clear, and this would be up to your CPC. Some CPCs will not fund school projects for this reasons, while others do. It's up to us. Um, CPA was created for assets that are permanently protected as conservation land, park land, historic resources, and affordable housing. The issue with recreational assets, assets on school property is that they don't have the permanent protection that park land and conservation land have. So you have no assurances the CPA funds invested on school recreational assets will be used for recreation in the future. We've seen issues with CPA funds that have been spent on recreational assets under control of the school department. For example, Gloucester used CPA funds four times between 2013 and 2017, totaling close to 200,000 to re rehabilitate Matos Field. And that site is soon to be used by the city for a new school. Um, a similar project using $500,000 in CPA funds was undertaken in East Hampton, and then a school was put on that field. There are other examples as well. Um, one of the issues often cited is that the public voted for CPA to pay for projects the entire community can be be benefit from. Um, school budgets often take up more than half a municipal budget, and certainly no one was thinking when they were voting to increase school funding when they cast a yes ballot for CPA. So some towns are reluctant to use CPA, instead asking that general municipal funds or bonds uh, plus private fundraising pay for improvements. So... We need to develop, I think, a policy because we've never had school projects come to us before um, so that there's guidance, right? Like sometimes this happens to us where an applicant will say like, well, man, I put time into eligibility and like it would have been helpful if I'd had guidance to know I shouldn't have even put it in, right? So what do we think about taking on school projects? Um, and like, do we want to take them under the historic category, but not under Parks and Rec? Or do we want to take them under Parks and Rec? What is our thought about that? Michael? Uh, Megan, what is the historical significance of Lawrence School? Lawrence School is a really neat, and like Chris can talk more about it because he saw the presentation last night, so does I, and so did I. But uh, Lawrence uh, is the name of a teacher who was a longtime teacher at a school um, in the early 1900s. And he then became longtime principal. He was one of the pioneers of like nature-based study being brought into schools, which is why he surrounded all of the schools with like tall, you know, planted trees and put ivy up buildings, all of that. And so when they built Lawrence, they named it after him and they built it in the Gothic revival style, which was really typical of the era. So like those two things together, both like it's named, you know, kind of crafted and, you know, named after this historic person, but also the Gothic revival nature of it um, tied to the same era, kind of following in the footsteps of the next era after City Hall 
gave it historic significance. But nothing happened historically there, like or North Church in Boston. Nothing historically occurred at the site of the Lawrence School. There's not a document, a presentation, an event, a battle of significance that would oh, that would yeah. justify it as to being an historical location. Yeah, there's multiple pathways to being named historic. It could be that it's an architectural style that's historic to the, an era that needs to be preserved. And so like the style of it's important for the envelope to be preserved. It could be something happened there. It could be that it is um, significant because of a person that was connected there, right? Like there's different pathways to something something being declared historic. Megan, but so are they going to redo the whole school? They're in the middle of massive improvements. Yeah, they've done the windows. Well, in terms of, are they, are they going to adhere to the historical guidelines by the state of Massachusetts? Or are they going to just do part to get our money and then just do the rest on the most energy efficient possible? Right. So th so that those are the exact questions that we need to be asking, because right now we don't have a policy on it. And that's Stuart's point in the coalition email. He was like, it's really important to think about, like, if there's other sources of funding, are they doing all parts of the project in this historic way or just taking like your money for this piece that's going to be historic because they don't think that's a good idea because that's not really what historic preservation is for. It's for the building, not for the thing that you're restoring. So I agree. that's a great question, Mike. And when they present yeah. to us, I think we have to ask those questions to know if it makes sense for us to fund them or not. But isn't the state legislature require that if you're going to, you can't do a part of a building historically and do the other part modern, uh, it's either going to be historic all the way or it's not. That's the gist I got out of the legislation. I didn't get the feeling that you could just use part of a building to call it historic, and then the other part of the building you put in brand new windows, brand new roofs. Um, you know, you don't, you're not historic whatsoever. Yeah. So I'm no, not... I don't have a good feeling about this. The goal. Plus, I don't know what's so historic about Lawrence School. I mean, we'll we'll hear more. You can watch the historic meeting from last night. And we'll make sure that we'll send out the, app, the presentations that got presented last night so the committee can review them. But in general, right, like so not specific to Lawrence School, but making a or Morgan Street Playground, right, but a policy so that like in the future, does a school department think they should come to CPA for funding? Like that's the wider question, right? And I want to hear from other people as well. So we've heard from Mike. What other thoughts does the committee have? This is new to us. Yes, Sarah. Um, so just kind of uh, initial reactions here, just kind of um, thinking about different things, but especially thinking about where Morgan School is located, um, you know, and, and a lot of schools um, kind of, you know, in the more downtown areas of, of Holyoke, um, you know, there there are precious few areas for for recreation, especially in, in downtown Holyoke. Um, and you know, I I believe that, you know, the playgrounds that are within the schools could potentially, you know, be be an important area, um, you know, for for recreation, um, for for people who, who kind of live in, in some of those areas. And I, I think that needs to be supported to make sure that, you know, there's there's access for all. I guess, you know, some of my questions would just be specifically about access and making sure that any playgrounds, um, you know, that that would be supported that are that are, you know, associated with schools um, would be accessible, you know, at at all times um, to, to others in the community as well. But um, just, you know, it, it seems to me like any any opportunity for for recreation for kids to get out and play in in an area that has a lot of a lot of streets. Um, you know, and and not a lot of of open space. Um, you know, relatively speaking, um, should should be something that's considered. Yep. Good yep. point, Chris. I I just I guess we look at a, a lot of these properties, especially the city properties. What is involved with actual maintenance? What does the city have for a budget? basically before applying to CPA. I mean, City Hall right now with the exterior, Lawrence School with the upkeep of the brickwork. I don't know, I'm just throwing that out there. So the city solicitor in the Girls Inc. project, you know, sort of took us to town on that one. 
and mm -hmm. it was we need to make sure that projects are restoration and not maintenance. Mm -hmm. uh, it can't be repair of, you know, a few bricks it has to be something that's really part of a holistic restoration of a property. And I may disagree with how they applied it in the Girls Inc. case. But um, I think that that's something to hold on to for, for us when we talk to applicants and when we decide to vote on applicants. Um, if, is this part of a restoration, right, where you are totally doing that, you know, making sure that this entire building is preserved in a historic way for the future? Okay, then that's like eligible and we should be voting for that. If it's just this is something that clearly is a small maintenance or repair project and it should be handled by private funding or by municipal funding, then I think we have to give that feedback. I do want to say that in our preservation plan, Stuart said we should look at what's in our preservation plan. We do actually name schoolyards and fields. Um, not that we can't amend it. Right, we could amend our our preservation plan to remove that, but it is named as an asset in here that we might consider for CPA funding. So you can see that underneath, and that I, again, I might disagree with it, but they say under the Parks and Rec Department, and they name all of these recreational assets. Now, technically, schoolyards and fields are not under Parks and Rec; they're underneath. I would such a quasi, right? Like they're kind of under Parks and Rec, but they're also under the school department. And I was talking to Sean Sheedy. One of the other policy pieces is right now, any city project, the next phase here is before their full application, we're going to send them a letter that says, hey, don't forget to fill out this form. And the form has them have go to the mayor and say, okay, do you support this project going forward for CPA funding? Yes or no. And who is the point person? on this project that the mayor's gonna oversee to make sure that this project happens and happens well. And so one of my questions actually is, because we never had a school project before, is the mayor still approving this? Or do we send this to Anthony Soto, the superintendent? Are they the ones who are signing off on this? And like, yes, I agree to this. And also I want this, or is this coming from the mayor? So that's another question. Is it city or is it school? Because I talked to Sean Sheedy and he said, well, it depends on my projects. Some of my projects go through the city and some go through um, the school department. Um, Sarah? Yeah. Sarah, do you have your hand up still or is it just uh, still up? There you go. Okay. Uh, right. Michael? Uh, Mr. Chairman and my fellow committee members, the school committee could make a decision in five years to take down the whole school. The mayor could support that. Maybe they're get a large grant from God and they can put a brand new school somewhere and they take down the whole thing. They're not obligated to sit by the CPA funding, which what we did. I mean, the illustration shown by these other schools, like East Hampton, they give five half a million dollars and then they put a school on it. Well, the yep. school committee can do the same thing here. They own the land and they are under no restrictions. And they're, they're not. They can in five years, six years, 10 years, they could take down the whole building and say, no, it's condemned. We're going to build it somewhere else. Well, where does that leave us? Exactly. I don't get a good feeling about these. Yep. Mary, I agree. Yep. That argument could certainly be applied to the YMCA as well. Mm -hmm. And many other people that apply for uh, playground um, uh, improvements. I yep. mean, they could decide, uh, okay, so remember Kelly Content Park? I mean, the lots of volunteers and donations went into fixing it, and it was wonderful. And then it needed to be replaced completely. So, I mean, you know, that's that's part of life. I, I can't yeah. see how that can be an argument for everybody. Well, I mean, we don't have the money. See yeah, how you can have an argument, apply that argument. You know, you have to apply it universally. Yeah, and okay. I think that no. the discussion is 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 about whether we want to have sort of a blanket policy on schools, uh, continue to, I suppose, as we're doing now, we haven't had any, but taking it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, Meg, I don't know if you had any proposed language or if you had a thought of how we might move forward, if you... If you um... Here's my suggestion. I think that I'm hearing... Craft a policy that just says, you know, something about requiring historic cohesion, right? Like if you're asking for a funding for a historic piece of your project, are you applying that same metric to all of your project? And if not, you're not eligible. Mm -hmm. I'm also hearing that uh, we may want to require a number of years as a clawback. 
Mm. which we could, right, we could say this land needs to be used as the playground for 15 years that we are putting in on this land. Um, and that if you do so before then, then that a certain percentage needs to be returned. And it's normally within a we've done it in the past. It's like, if it's, you know, the first five years, it's a hundred percent. Right. And if it's the next five years, it's 50%. And if it's the last five years, it's 25%. Mm. Right. Sort of like diminishing returns a little bit, but like trying to create a little bit of a mechanism where it's very clear that we don't want to submit this. And then there's this, you know, a new school built or a new use for that land within a certain number of years. Well, so I, I think that could look at it next meeting that'd be great meg if you if you would if you would um I, I cut meg off she said uh i i apologize um she was saying she she can draft some language that we can consider not that we necessarily are approving uh that language but that uh sort of outlining the discussion that we had and i just think also um uh sort of to follow up on on helene's uh point uh, well-made earlier is that if if we're unlikely to be funding a project and and you know many many school projects may fall under that unlikely category it would be beneficial for them to know that a, ahead of time and, and not have us drag them through the process so i think there's you know a lot of motivation for us to kind of be thoughtful about this and um sort of delve into it and i think meg has signed up to um to do some to do some uh, preparation for us, and then we can consider that uh, perhaps next meeting or or in a subsequent meeting, um, if everybody feels comfortable. Did anybody have any other thoughts on on that topic? Again, just because we find something eligible doesn't mean you have to vote for it. Yep, yep, yep. And say hey, it's eligible, and the committee could then in the end say, yeah, but we don't want to. We're going to always prioritize non-school department projects. So if there's other playgrounds that are competing with you, just know your project won't be funded, right? So like you call around, talk to the department heads, you decide when you wanna put in an application. If you know you're, if it's your round and no one else is coming forward, maybe it could be funded, but it's gonna have to take second seat to other municipal properties that provide more access to a wider variety of the public, right? Because one of the things that we have to do is make sure there's a public benefit. Yep. And Mary, did you have your hand up? Well, I think it's great uh, that uh, Megan is going to develop that. And that's in regards to the um, the parks, uh, the excuse me, the schools. Um, but will that also be the a policy in regards to how, uh, people applying for things? Um, because in that case, I think we also need a policy for the other categories as well or at least I can think of for the housing, I'd like to see uh, some kind of a, a caveat or a policy saying that you must have some kind of oversight for your compliance. So, um, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, so anyway, I, I think we need a few things here is basically what I'm saying. Yeah. No, I'm hearing you. Sarah, you have your hand up. Yes, um, sorry, this just kind of came to mind, but um, just uh, a, a question to kind of build on, you know, what what Mary just said and and kind of um, what was what was going on um, with uh, two two of the um, you know proposed projects um, being deemed just you know ineligible or not ineligible, but um, just not not able to be funded. Um, is there a way that Perhaps applicants can, I, I don't know exactly what the compliance requirements are, um, but can they build into their applications a provision to, um, you know, have an outside party ensure compliance or, or something like that? Or is that just something? Yeah, it's not crazy. That's, yeah. interesting. That's what we need to figure out. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Um, okay. So just moving it along, moving it along. Um, agenda item number six, um, just an update. I think everybody, um, I hope anyway, has felt included in the, uh, the hiring process of the, uh, of a, of a new CPA administrator. I think we were very lucky. We had 11 applicants. We had a lot of very 
high quality applicants. And I think the committee sort of coalesced around four, um, four top candidates emerged. It was pretty consistent. Um, I've invited them, as we all know, to a meeting on the 25th of November. They've all accepted. They will all be there. Um, I think um, <clears throat> the only thing I wanted to mention is that um, you know, that that night of the interview, we will have the opportunity to go into an executive session and um, and take a vote on on whether or not we want to hire one of those four candidates. Um, there's a little bit of a process to that. And I've spoken with um, with some folks um, about that. And, and I think. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that that's just, I'm going to send out an agenda. It, there's an open meeting law uh, situation here. So we have to, we have to adhere by that. And um, I have to state exactly why we are going into executive committee. Um, so the public knows ahead of time what, what's going on. Um, you know, certainly the, the discussions around hiring somebody are private. And I think that um, that's not something that needs to be um, out for public um, consumption but we're going to we're going to tell the public that that's what we're doing and they'll they'll have to trust that we're doing a good job and i think that that's um that's what we're thinking helene um and if you put this in an email and i didn't notice it i apologize but um in terms of like references because mm. i wouldn't necessarily want to hire someone without having done the reference check no. um but i don't you know often that comes after an interview um and we're having a public meeting, so I guess it's pretty public knowledge that they're being interviewed, at least that they applied. But um, but I'm wondering if we would re do reference check for them before this meeting, the interview, or if it would be after, if we could vote in executive session, for example, like this is our first choice, that the references come back as, quote, you know, good. <laughs> And if not, then this would be our second choice, something like that. So because I, I wouldn't want to, I guess, I just feel like that's also an important part of any kind of hiring step. And I'd want to make sure there's a way for that to be integrated. No, absolutely. And I've, I've spoken at length with Kelly Kern, our personnel director about this. So she sort of guided us on it. And um, that's exactly the plan is that, um, you know, if if the committee, in fact, uh, picks a candidate on the 21st, that we would be voting essentially to choose them as our admin pending um, a personnel review, which would include a Corey check, which would include um, those types of checks to ensure that that, um, you know, they are who they say they are and and um, and all of that. So that was uh, the process that uh, that Kelly and I um had discussed and I felt that that was uh, most appropriate. So essentially we'll, we'll pick somebody, Kelly and, and her department will check them out, make sure everything's on the up and up and then we'll, and then we'll be able to officially hire them. So, um, but yeah, excellent, excellent point. And that, um, that was the, that was the process. And, and the thought too, is I think that it's, um, it was a lot um, to go through all of the applicants ahead of time too, for them, so I think that's, you know, from my perspective, I just wanted to narrow it down as much as possible for personnel so they could um, they could handle it easily. And they've been just, uh, for the record, very supportive, very responsive. Um, Kelly, Kelly said, you know, anything that you guys need, just let just let me know. And, and, and she's uh, she's been great. So but I think, uh, you know, I'm excited. I think, um, you know, the committee needs an admin and I think. Um, you know, we're at our best with, with an admin. And I think some of the, all, uh, frankly, all four candidates are outstanding. We, 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 we would be, uh, we would be doing well with any of them, but, um, you know, I think we'll, we'll, we'll pick somebody and we'll be able to move forward. And I just wanted to, you know, bring it up in the, in the, in the meeting. I think, um, you know, we're doing our best to, to communicate via email. And, and like I said, if anybody feels, um, like they they're missing information or that they'd like to be looped in more, please, um, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. I'd be my, you know, I'd be happy to, to fill you in as much as possible. So, um, okay. they, do you have any other questions or concerns on that process? Mr. Chairman, you're you saying that you want us to hire somebody on the 25th. I, I'd like to, if we could, I mean, I, I, um, you know, I, I, we're not, we're not, we don't have to, I think we, we may, um, 
you know, we may go through those interviews that night and say, you know, we'd like to take a couple days and 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 uh, give ourselves an opportunity to think this one through. Um, or we may go through those interviews and say, oh, this candidate is, you know, is is very clearly the the, the preferred choice of a majority of our committee. And I think, um, you know, I'd like to give us a little wiggle room. I think ideally, I, I'd like to have somebody hired if we could, but I'm not going to. I don't think we want to force it either. I think if the if it's the will of the committee to to push it, um, I, I'll absolutely do that, and we can set a special meeting, um, you know, at a future date, just to have a, essentially an executive session to have uh, to have that vote. So that's the way I'm thinking of it. Um, is is that the hope is that we can, and but but that there's some flexibility for us to to kind of see how 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 it plays out. If that sounds uh, so like something everybody's comfortable with, yes, yeah, Perfect. sounds good. Perfect. Um, so agenda item seven um, is just a discussion, and this is a little bit um, sort of abstract, but it's um, just about our presentations in January. So I just wanted to, um, you know, my my personal philosophy is that I'd like to keep um, our meetings uh, available in Zoom for for as long as as possible. I think that that flexibility is really important for a lot of people, including myself sometimes. So um, that being said, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm toying with the idea of maybe having our, um, our public presentations, uh, more of a, more of a hybrid uh, meeting where, where it'd be available on zoom, but also in person. I think that that um, does increase uh, accessibility to people. I'm not, everybody's uh, comfortable on zoom. Not everybody likes to go to zoom. Some folks like to go to, go to the meeting and sit there and watch the presentations and some folks like to present in person. So, um, you know, I was able to go to the historical commission last night, Chris, and I thought, Chris, you know, essentially you, that's what you're already doing. You're running a hybrid meeting, um, where you're in person and you have folks uh, available to, um, to meet via zoom. So I just wanted to kind of throw that idea out to the, uh, to the committee that I, I'm thinking of that of, 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 you know, just to be clear, it would still be available on zoom for folks to, you know, you, you don't, you're not bound to show up. It would just have the option of the public to come in and, and be in person and, 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 and engage with the, with the committee and for folks to present, um, two locations that we might, um, use is, uh, Hoyoke city council chambers. I spoke with, uh, Jeff Anderson Burgos on the topic already. He's the, um, administrative assistant to the city council and he you know he was he, he said that that's acceptable and that that there's some technical uh obstacles to overcome and that of course scheduling um you know this it's the city council chamber so we we need to work around their schedule but um that we could make that work um the other location might be uh the same room where chris has his historical commission meetings um i don't know if that what is that just the fourth floor conference room of the city hall annex um, it's, it's set up for it. There's a, there's an ample space. There's, uh, you know, the technology is there, the, the, the TV and, uh, and all of that. So, um, you know, I just was, was looking for some, just for some opinions on that and how, how folks felt about it. Good idea. We're in a meeting just so you know, everybody feel good about that. My daughter's joined us here. You can say hello. Ask her. Hello. <laughs> All right. I'm almost done, sweetheart. I'll be down in a minute. All right. Um, so yeah, that's the, you know, there's not really much to discuss there, but I just um just to be clear, you know, I don't I don't ever want to get rid of Zoom. I, I I think it allows us uh, you know, people who otherwise wouldn't be able to participate to participate. And um I think that that's important, but I'd like to offer the in person uh if possible. So what I refer to as a hybrid. So is that something you're going to pursue or? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I think um, if everybody, um, I'm not sure we need to take a vote on it, but it's, um, if everybody feels comfortable with it, I think, um, you know, I think it will be a good thing. Like I said, I just want folks, I want it to be as accessible as possible. And I think sometimes an in-person meeting, um, you know, for myself, I can admit it took me, I think, 45 minutes to realize uh, how to raise my hand in Zoom. I was like clicking around for you know, half of my first meeting trying to figure out how to raise my hand. So it's, you know, it, it can be intimidating for people and, um, you know, maybe the in-person would be more accessible. So that's, I'll, 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 uh, look at our options and I'll present them to the committee and we can, uh, we can move forward. But that was the thought on that. Um, contract updates, um, everything should be good to go. We've got a hold of the, uh, far alpaca development. That was kind of our outstanding contract. So, um, 
we're just waiting for that to kind of go through the signature process. Um, we use an app called Sign Now, which um, you know I'll sign it, and then it goes to the applicant. They sign it, the, then the city solicitor reviews it and signs it, and then the last uh, person is the mayor. So Mayor Garcia will um, review our our uh, our contracts and sign them for us. So we're we're good to go um, with our FY twenty four uh, contracts, and then uh, oh, what do I have here for number nine? Oh, project updates. Um, the only one I've got, we're, we're working I, I, on uh, Jones Point quite a bit. Um, we're sort of in the process of, of of having the information that would be useful to everyone. So I'll be able to get some numbers and some kind of a, a, a rough plan on, on that soon to everybody. And I'll share that information whenever I get it. Just so everyone knows, I'm not holding any information. Anything I get that I think is useful, I send out. So yeah. Um, I'll update folks on that. Wisteria Hearst, if you may recall, we took a vote a couple of uh, meetings ago on a uh, change of scope of work. And um, that was uh, sent to the city council. It went to subcommittee. Um, I went before the finance subcommittee and just discussed the project. And it went to the full council and the full council approved it. So I let Megan uh, at Wisteria Hearst know that. And she's uh, working with Ted right now from purchasing to uh, move that project forward. So she's going to get a, a couple of extra, uh, a couple of extra rooms done and uh, without any extra money. So those are, those are our updates. Um, is there any old business that we needed to discuss? Um, one thing I can mention is um, when I first took over as chair of the committee, uh, Meg had said to me, like, what, you know, what are you nervous about? And I said, I'm nervous that I'm going to forget something. I'm going to just not think of something and we uh, are the, the first instance of that happens. I forgot and I take full responsibility to send the city council our uh, meeting minutes the, as is required. So they, um, they uh, you know, made me aware of that and I uh, have sent those over with my uh, deepest apologies. So just an update on that one. We're, we're, we're getting through it. Um, but uh, having an admin in place soon will, will help us avoid those types of uh, small oversights. But uh, I do apologize. That was my uh, my mistake. So did any other anyone else have any other uh, old business that they wanted to bring up? Chris? Yes, very quickly, uh, Jay, thank you for doing more research about the documents yep. from the last round. And... Um, I just wanted to bring again to the commission the issue that we're having with the building department for our preservation restrictions. Yes. Uh, I would really uh, need your help, Jay, to pursue with the building department, the mayor, what have you, to really get this off the ground and have the yep. support of the historical commission. Yep, absolutely. And what Chris is referring to is there are some historical uh I call them historical restriction, preservation restrictions on some of the projects that we've done. And we've asked the uh, city to uh, the building department to review and just ensure that those are being complied with a compliance issue. And um, I've uh, committed to Chris and, and let him know that I, I will um, will continue to pursue that. And we haven't really made good progress on that one. So I do apologize, Chris. Um, the documents uh, from the previous uh funding cycle we have made some progress on. So we're we're hoping to get those secured, but um, the preservation restrictions we do need to speak with uh, the building department on. So we'll, we'll work on that one as well. Is that, I mean, is that something we can maybe talk about another point too? Again, what Mary had said about housing. I mean, one body, one person taking care of this, all of this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, um, yeah, I think, just in general eligibility, we learned a lot in eligibility and I think we can kind of uh, give some guidelines to folks. And, and I think that's, that's one of the, one of the categories that we'd be able to do that. Mary. Uh, just one other old business item to bring up, not tonight, but the next time. And that is the sign in regards to the stained glass windows, any progress? If no, uh, then yeah. let's just do it next time. Oh, I'll be happy to give you the update. So we, uh, you know, we uh, essentially we had a sign up already a nice historic sign. It was quite expensive as well. Um, and it was taken down by some folks. And then we invited those folks to our meeting to say, 
you know, why did you take our sign down and how can we work on a, on a solution together? So, you know, what, what ended up happening was they made their own sign. It was that, uh, sort of, uh, very basic sign that we all saw before I asked them not to, I asked, I specifically asked them not to make that sign. I said, I'd like to, you know, have a discussion with the committee. We had a, you know, a historically appropriate sign and that sign doesn't fit for our city hall. I don't, frankly, like the wording of it. And I'd like us to make this decision together. I'd like the CPA to make this decision um, along, you know, along with the trustees uh, or the uh, friends of City Hall. And they they just essentially ignored us and made their own sign and um, and then sent me a, a picture of the sign and said, oh, look, we have that sign. And I said, uh, you know, that's no good. I don't, I, that's not what, that's not what we asked for. That's not what we wanted. And, uh, you know, I wasn't thrilled about it. So that's kind of the update on it. Um, what we want to do about it is kind of another question. Do we care enough about a sign? I mean, uh, I do. I didn't like the principle of it, but my where I am is that we just have so much going on. I just couldn't, I didn't have the bandwidth to, 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 to go to battle on it. You know, I'm trying to get the admin and the eligibility and the contracts and all of those things. So, but that is the update. So it didn't really work out well. I think we invited them in good faith to uh, to work out something and they kind of, you know, just uh, ignored us and di and did what they had to do. But um, you know, they are up up in front of us for another application. So I think we can kind of uh, address that then, as you know, try to figure out a, a solution that's most appropriate. So that is wait. That so you don't tell me that the uh, the the faux sign, the new sign, is up. They didn't put it up, right? I don't know if it's up. They just showed it. What? It's been, it's been made, and somebody has it, and it's it's. You know, it, it, I I won't be surprised if it's up soon, Chris. No, it was actually just a protege. Um, but I okay. highly re recommend we take the old sign and have it put back immediately where it was, and then we're over. It's done and over with. Yeah, the the previous sign is 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 more appropriate. It's it's historically appropriate for the location. I think the only issue anyone had with the sign was that you know certain folks name the name wasn't involved were yes. yeah so yeah that's the issue with the sign and i i agree i think that's our our hope is to get that other original sign put back up but um you know like i said i lacked the bandwidth to uh, go to battle over the sign so that's where we are but um okay. it is what time is it 7 35 this is my longest meeting as chair so far so not bad we're still getting in under the two hour uh under the two hour uh guideline so we do our best and i uh, appreciate everybody um if anyone doesn't have any other uh no. questions or concerns i'd uh entertain a vote to uh, or a proposal to end the meeting um so moved. A and a second second all we're right. all we're all in favor <laughs> we're ready we're ready I, there's dinner downstairs and my kids are ready for me to get that money, so <laughs> I'll, uh, I appreciate everybody very much. And, uh, you know, like I said, don't hesitate to reach out if there's ever any questions or concerns, Lauren, I'm going to reach out to you about the housing stuff, if you don't mind. And, um, we'll see you, uh, our next meeting will be the, the, uh, actually our next meeting is the 25th of November. That's our, right. uh, interviews. And so, you know, if anybody has any thoughts or anything, just don't hesitate and, and we'll see you at that meeting. And our next full CPA meeting will be as always the second Wednesday of December, uh, from six to eight. So that's the, uh, that's the plan. So okay. everybody enjoy your evening and thanks so much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.